as we prepare to hear God's word for us today, let us first come together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So the scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 to 26, and can be found in your pew Bible on page 64 if you'd like to follow along. Listen now to the word of God. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what the ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the word of the Lord. remember from a couple years back when how um, hashtag blessed was a common way of expressing joy and delight on social media. It was a popular tweet. I haven't noticed it as much recently. Is it still a popular tweet? Hashtag blessed? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So it's, it's still around, but there was a time when Hashtag blessed was the way people shared their good fortune. When someone was on a fabulous vacation, they'd post a picture and type hashtag blessed as a descriptor. Or there'd be a photo of a new car and underneath hashtag blessed. I don't think there is a more polar opposite understanding of blessing between the way hashtag blessed is most often presented today and the way Jesus beatitudes or blessings are presented in Luke. I wonder if hashtag blessed is perhaps even better known than the beatitudes that Wendy just read to us from Luke's Gospel. Let's acquaint ourselves with Luke's Beatitudes, with Luke's blessings. The word Beatitude is derived from Latin and it means a state of blessedness or fortunate circumstance, a privileged situation or well-off. Scholars from the spectrum of theological persuasions, conservative to liberal, agree that the words of the Beatitudes form the very center, the core of Jesus' ministry. Two of the Gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, offer an account of the Beatitudes. Most of us are more familiar with Matthew's 
version of the Beatitudes. His is longer. It's 111 verses compared to Luke's 33 verses. The two accounts, however, are different in several ways. Matthew's version is called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus went up a mountain to deliver his message to just a few chosen disciples. Luke's version is called the Sermon on the Plain because Luke reports that Jesus came down from the mountain with the disciples he'd called and a huge crowd surrounded him as he stood on a level plain or a level place. Matthew's version of the Beatitudes has been called spiritualized because he writes, blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke is more blunt or plain. Blessed are the poor. Matthew says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Luke, blessed are you who are hungry now. Matthew relates his Beatitudes in the third person, blessed are those. Luke brings the words home, blessed are you now, right now. Finally, Matthew keeps things upbeat, focusing only on the blessings. Luke matches each of the blessings with a curse or a woe. Matthew's version is more palatable to our sensibilities. Luke, well, Luke seems more difficult. And our passage for today is just the first section of the Sermon on the Plain, consisting of four blessings and four woes to match the blessings. Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Plain tells us about God's culture, or rather, God's kingdom. When we read this passage in Luke's gospel, we are acquainting ourselves with a culture that just might be very different from the one to which we are accustomed. Jesus doesn't tell anyone in this sermon to go and do anything. He simply announces the way things are in the kingdom of God. His language is not imperative, it's indicative. Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor. And we believe blessed are the rich. Jesus says, blessed are you who are hungry now. And we believe, blessed are those who have plenty. And Jesus says, blessed are you who weep now. And we believe, blessed are those who are cheerful and happy. Luke's sermon is plain. Why would Jesus say things that seem to make no common sense and turn our understanding of blessedness upside down? we can hear how Jesus presents the opposite of our hashtag blessed culture in the Sermon on the Plain. So let's look at what some theologians and commentators have to say about it. The theologian Gustavo Gutierrez comments that God has a preferential love for the poor not because they are necessarily better than others, morally or religiously, but simply because they are poor and living in an inhuman situation that's contrary to God's will. The ultimate basis for the privileged position of the poor is not the poor themselves, but in God, in the gratuitousness and the universality of God's agapic love. So Gutierrez is a liberation theologian. This means his main focus is God's preferential treatment for the poor. And at the same time, liberation theologians are devoted to helping the poor's plight here on earth, almost to the exclusion of everything else. And then the French philosopher Simone Weil, she's also a theologian, who also recognized the privilege of the poor, she revered St. Francis of Assisi, that monk who himself was born into wealth and sold 
all that he had so he could live simply. Simone Weil writes, as for the spirit of poverty, I do not remember any moment when it was not in me. I fell in love with St. Francis of Assisi as soon as I came to know about him. I always believed and hoped that one day fate would force upon me the condition of a vagabond and a beggar, which he embraced freely. So Gutierrez, St. Francis, and Simone Weil utter unusual statements about the poor, and all are very familiar with Jesus' teachings. They point us to an unexplored option and one that doesn't necessarily mesh well with our hashtag blessed culture and lifestyle. Perhaps Jesus is suggesting that wealth and fullness lead to self-sufficiency and self-absorption, a state of independence that distances us from God and leads us to glorify ourselves instead of the Holy One who has given us life. Maybe some of you have had this experience. When everything's going along just fine, your prayer life suffers. And church happens when you decide you can fit it in. You and I, more often than not, focus on keeping the good times going, on making the most of it, and on squeezing out what time we can for God. But then, when the crisis comes, things change. We lose our job, or we hear about a loved one with cancer, or our marriage is on the rocks, or our world crumbles. And suddenly, God becomes very important again. And we turn to faith in scripture and search for meaning and for a way out of the struggle. It just may happen that when we become poor, weak, or sad, we restart our search for God and find that God has been waiting there the whole time. As I've shared with you previously, that has been my experience. That has been, it's been in my sadness, in my suffering, in my poverty, that I have known God most fully. Now, we most absolutely do not want to glorify poverty, hunger, mourning, or exclusion. For these are conditions for which none of us would wish. It would be an idolatry to glorify any condition of ours. These are, however, conditions that are. They are present. And remarkably, when you and I find ourselves in these conditions, our God is right there with us. And just perhaps, we may even see God more clearly because the haze of success and wealth has been lifted from our eyes. In our passage for today, Jesus is not offering a recipe for success or the keys to happiness or a roadmap to having the best life now. Rather, Jesus demonstrates once again that God regularly and relentlessly shows up just where we least expect God to be in order to give to us freely what we can neither earn nor achieve. Blessedness. The preacher and author Barbara Brown Taylor offers the image of a Ferris wheel as a way to make sense of the Sermon on the Plain. The Ferris wheel will go around so that those who are swaying at the top with visions of distant lights twinkling will have their turn at the bottom, while those who are at the bottom 
where all they can see are candy wrappers and sawdust, will have their chance to see out the horizon. It is not advice. It is not even judgment. It is simply the truth about the way things are pronounced by someone who loves everyone on that wheel. Now, speaking of amusement rides, recently I saw a list of the 11 fastest roller coasters in the world for 2019. King's Dominion Intimidator 305 made the list, which is the tallest and fastest roller coaster on the East Coast. At top speed, Intimidator 305 reaches 90 miles per hour. And I read that one criteria that's used to determine what makes a roller coaster ride great is the amount of the adrenaline rush. When it debuted, there were reports of passengers graying out on the Intimidator 305 ride because of the adrenaline rush. So, stay with me here. Let's make an analogy of the Ferris wheel and the Intimidator 305. It could be that our contemporary culture in music, art, finance, and entertainment says over and over to us, that what is important is the adrenaline rush, the pounding dance hall beat, the thrill of extreme sports, the rush of instant wealth, the exotic vacation. In this view, the loveliness and importance of the Ferris wheel is incomprehensible because there is no adrenaline rush. And Jesus reminds us over and over and does so again here in the Beatitudes that the adrenaline rush is unimportant and may even be dangerous to what is central in life. In this view, the Intimidator 305, after 10 rides or so, becomes mundane and makes us sick. In Jesus' view, it is the journey of life, the movement through exalted visions and sawdust-covered trash that is central. Now, many of us will ride the Intimidator 305, and we will all try to make money, take fabulous vacations, and have successes in life. We, what we cannot do as Christians is ever mistake any of these adrenaline rushes for what is central. The adrenaline rushes of the Intimidator 305, of contemporary culture, of wealth, of the new car, hashtag blessed, are dangerous illusions of blessedness. Dangerous because they lead us away from true blessedness. The Ferris wheel isn't just a simple, antiquated, old-fashioned ride that can be dismissed but it is somehow central to the experience of the amusement park. Poverty, suffering, sadness, exclusion are not conditions that must be eradicated. They are central to the Christian life and certainly to Jesus' life. The Beatitudes don't tell us what to do. They tell us who we are. And more importantly, they tell us who Jesus is. The news that Jesus shares with us and that Jesus shared so long ago is that neither the going up nor the coming down is under our control. But wherever we happen to be, the promise is the same. Blessed are you who lose your grip on the way things are, for God will lead you into the way things shall be. And in that, you and I are blessed. Amen.